Today on WGVU's Decision 2018 Candidate Forum, we profile U.S. House of Representatives candidates as a lead up to the November general election. Hear directly from the candidates as we ask them about key issues. This is an opportunity for you, the voter, to make an informed decision. Welcome to Decision 2018, the U.S. House of Representatives Candidate Forum. Today, we turn our attention to the U.S. House of Representatives race in Michigan's 6th Congressional District. Today's forum with our first guest was recorded Monday, August 6th from the studios of the Meyer Public Broadcast Center at Grand Valley State University. Now, let us begin by introducing Republican incumbent U.S. Representative Fred Upton from St. Joseph. Fred, thank you for being here. Always a pleasure. And there's always something happening in D.C. And can you imagine what's <laughs> going to happen between now and when this airs? So I'll come back if we need to do a little. All right, and we will accept that yeah. offer. Um, I'm going to kick off with something that uh, is impacting so many people in your district, the, um, the PFAS water crisis. It seems like this is spreading across the state and across the country. Uh, we're talking about Parchment, uh, Cooper Township, and the response. What is the federal government's, or what should the EPA's response be to these types of concerns? A couple things. First of all, they're very engaged, as they should be. We learned a big lesson from Flint a number of years ago when the EPA was aware of what the lead in the water, and they sat on their hands, and President Obama, to his credit, sacked, fired the re EPA regional director in Chicago. She was gone the next day. Dan Kildee, who represents Flint, and I worked together. We passed legislation that President Obama signed that said when the EPA is ever aware of these situations, unsafe drinking water, they have to be fully transparent. They have to come forward literally within 24 hours, work with the governor, work with the DEQ, develop a plan to remedy the situation. When we learned about parchment, credit to Governor Snyder, who said every community regardless of size, their municipal water supplies need to be tested. So that's parchment. There are 3,100 users with, with Cooper Township, so they got the first test and literally within a couple of days, 20 times higher than the standard allowed. Now, when I got the word that late afternoon, my first question was, is EPA involved? Are they on the ground? The answer was yes. So as we work on this, lots of questions. We need a long-term plan to identify, obviously, as we tape this, water is still being supplied to the folks. Hopefully when people watch this, it's, it's not they're hooked into the Kalamazoo system. But EPA has to be engaged, involved, sign off. Uh, a couple, uh, I guess about 10 days prior to when we learned about parchment, Dan Kildee and I both signed a letter to the EPA saying, what should the standard be? This is somewhat arbitrary. 70 parts per trillion. Should it be, we didn't say that. Should it be 40? Should You know, what, whatever it should be. If it should be less, we need to expedite this as fast as we can. I'm a co-sponsor of legislation to do that because we want it to be safe. But my guess is, and again, Michigan's the only state right now that's being tested. Other states have this. This is in fire retardant, retardant. it's at airports, it's, uh, you know, Scotch Guard, all these different things. My guess is we're going to find a lot more communities uh, engaged and, uh, with this uh, bad number, and we are going to have a hearing in our committee, in fact, to explore this, bring the different parties in, but also use it as an example of what, you know, wh wh where should we be. Immigration. Um, I know that you are a secure the borders guy, but then there's the question of the path to citizenship, issues with DACA, a wall who pays for it. Where are you when it comes to immigration in its totality? I've always been for immigration reform. It is a broken system for you name it. Uh, I met with a good number of our dreamers, uh, employers, whether it be agriculture or not, uh, family members, etc. Uh, it's broken. The longer we don't do anything, the more broken it gets. So I was part of a bipartisan effort. You know, I, I signed the discharge petition, forcing the issue to the House floor uh, back in June, earlier this summer, late June, early July, and was part of a bipartisan effort then to say, how do we fix this? Yeah, we ought to have a pathway to citizenship, uh, and we also need the proper border security. Now, that doesn't mean a wall for a couple thousand miles that who knows what the cost is. Remember, the president initially talked about 
a um, Mexico paying for it, so you know, we, I mean, that meant <laughs> we didn't have to, but obviously we know, we know different. But I'm convinced that we can come together with a bipartisan partisan solution to deal with it. Uh, not only a pathway for the dreamers, uh, uh, an ag component, which we need, and I've been meeting with my farmers, my Farm Bureau community all summer long, and they're just fit to be tied, uh, leaving literally hundreds of thousands of dollars. This is individual farmers' crops in the field because they don't have the, the workers to get them out. But, you know, here in Michigan, our unemployment rate, we're pretty much full on uh, employment levels right now. Some counties, at, even at 2%. You can't go anywhere without employers uh, looking for people to work. Uh, you're not going to send 11 million people back. So we need to figure this out. Uh, we need to get a bill that the president can sign. He actually supported the legislation that at the end of the day, we had a majority of Republican support, but we didn't get enough to get it passed. Separating families. Wrong. That's, that is, is wrong. I, I joined those early on saying that it's wrong. Actually, of course, here in Grand Rapids, Bethany Christian Services, I've been meeting with them for more than a year in terms of the good work that they've done. But kids should not, particularly infants, but even eight, nine-year-olds should not be separated from their parents. Health care. Uh, you support repealing and replacing the Affordable Care Act. What would you replace it with, or is there a, a better... I guess, a better pathway for the federal government to deal with health care? You know, look, at the end of the day, we didn't have the votes. We barely had the votes in the House. Uh, I laid out a couple of standards that I strongly believed in. I wanted to protect those with pre-existing illnesses. I wanted to uh, allow people to pick and choose, keep their own health care plan if, if they wanted it. That was one of my amendments uh, early on. Uh, I wanted to protect states that did expand Medicaid, and Michigan did, but I wanted to keep that whole, and we, and we did. But at the end, of course, the Senate didn't do anything. And so we have this system that's really not working very well. Uh, but I would still rely on those uh, provisions. Actually, on the health care side, when I was chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, our big initiative, I mean, we passed this 51 to nothing in committee, uh, 396 votes in the House, to expedite the approval of drugs and devices. It was called 21st Century Cures. It was coupled with $45 billion more in health research uh, for the NIH. So we worked with all the stakeholders, Alzheimer's, diabetes, cancer, et cetera, because we're going to find a cure for these, and we're going to find a cure because of our cures bill that we got done. Uh, that was bipartisan, and that's where we got to be focusing our efforts today, but particularly protecting those with preexisting illnesses. You are a believer in job-creating free trade agreements. Uh, recently, we've seen wide-ranging tariffs uh, slapped on products from China to the European Union countries to Canada to Mexico. There are probably a number of countries in South America as well. What do you think the long-term impacts of this will be, and is it the right course of action in your mind? Well, I hope that when this airs, this issue is over because somehow we have a better trade agreement with some of these uh, countries that are out there because I know that otherwise it's we the consumers that pay this in lots of ways not only higher prices for a cost of a vehicle the auto industry is thinking thousands of dollars uh, I had spent some time with the chairman of Ford uh, not too long ago I mean they would not have invested two and a half billion dollars to revamp their facility in the south side of Chicago had they known that a 25% tariff on aluminum was coming when they've got to do five-year contracts. That wouldn't happen. I, I talked to my farmers, whether it be soybeans, corn, apples, uh, in, in terms of, you know, where are they going to be if, they can't, if we can't export apples from Washington State this fall? And that tariff from China hits, all of a sudden that backloads on us, and they, they don't have a product of which... They invested all this money, spraying everything else uh, in advance. So I'm hoping when this airs, it's over, that it's used as a, you know, a sort of a, uh, a knock on the door. Maybe we can get a, a better trade deal, but we know that we can't, you know, ratcheting this up, getting into a real trade war, it hurts everybody, particularly here in Michigan if it, if it moves over, migrates to the auto sector already. We're hearing from a lot of auto parts suppliers. They're beginning to lay people off. That's not a good sign. U.S. Representative Fred Upton. Hey, thanks, Patrick, thanks so much.
We continue our candidate forum. This portion recorded Wednesday, August 15th with Democratic challenger Dr. Matt Longjohn from Portage. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Well, there is an environmental concern in the place in which you live. It concerns uh, PFAS, uh, Portage, Cooper Township. The response, in your mind, what response or what role does the government play in a response to an environmental issue like PFAS? Um, the government has a critical role to play, uh, both from the federal as well as the state and local levels. Uh, we have to make sure that people have access to and can um, use safe drinking water. It's, uh, it's a, a basic of human life. And when we have a city government, a state government, a federal government working to protect citizens, it has to include environmental protections. Uh, PFAS isn't like lead. It's not something that we've been testing for for 70 years as an emerging contaminant. Um, so there's you know, a, a period of time where government has to catch up uh, and make sure that contaminants are being tested for and discovered. Um, and we're in that period of time. Um, but, um, you know, this is something that has been brewing uh, and multiple reports have shown contamination over a couple of years. So, um, you know, I like to see things continue to move forward at a faster clip. Uh, we can't just uh, have communication between the EPA and city government and parchment, et cetera. Uh, having Kalamazoo pipe water in is going to be a good short-term solution. But we have to keep funding going through the EPA to state DEQ and make sure that wells all over the state are being tested, not just in parchment. Uh, I suspect that because of the use of PFAS and things like firefighting foam, et cetera, we're going to see a lot of contamination across the state. And it's good that we're getting our arms around it, but we cannot, we cannot uh, stop or short circuit that effort of seeking out those contaminants and uh, applying the solutions. EPA doing enough? Um, the EPA has been doing um, well for a couple years in terms of educating states about what they need to start doing. Um, but I think it's a question of funding and making sure that the, the testing uh, methods, the science around the standards of safety continue to evolve. Um, we've allowed, and in some cases, members of Congress have helped the EPA to hide some emerging science, making it feel like it's going to be too difficult to deal with this problem. Right now, the parts per trillion for PFAS safety level is set at about 70 parts per trillion. There's some science saying that that level should be down as low as 13, 15. Uh, we can't hide that science. We need to make sure that there's uh, visibility into the emerging science and react accordingly. Science changes, so you know, it's not like we're going to hold the government accountable for things that we didn't know before now. But when standards change, we've got to keep up for the safety and well-being, the quality of life of everyone in this district and across the country. As a uh, congressman, when it comes to immigration, uh, is there a policy that you would like to see for a path to citizenship? What is your belief or feeling on funding a wall? Where, where are you on immigration? Yeah, um, so immigration's obviously been a, a huge topic this summer, and it should be. Um, the family separations that we were seeing at the border were inhumane and, in my view, violence. Um, that zero tolerance policy of the administration is going to have lifelong impact on those families who are often refugees trying to enter the country legally. Um, and calling them criminals, I think, was uh, a huge mistake, uh, a problem. Uh, I believe that uh, comprehensive immigration reform does include a pathway to citizenship. I do support the DACA program and DREAMers. Uh, I think that if you just go back to 2013, we had a supermajority in the Senate pass comprehensive immigration policy. It was only leadership in the Republican House that refused to bring that up to a vote. Um, and so I think the rhetoric needs to match where we were at in 2013. We should go back to where we had comprehensive immigration reform on, uh, on the docket to be voted upon and bring that up and add some clauses to make sure that this zero tolerance policy is not anything that could be allowed for under the law. But I think that we had a great starting point in 2013. We don't need to go back too far to pick up the pieces and move forward. Healthcare, you're a doctor. The Affordable Care Act, do you support it, or do you think repeal and replace is a good idea? Um, I do not support repeal and replace. Uh, there were aspects of the Affordable Care Act that were very good for a number of people. It was not sufficient. Uh, it was really insurance reform. Uh, and we have to do a lot more around health care delivery reform as well as insurance reform. 
But we cannot waive pre-existing condi conditions coverage or coverage for essential health benefits, both of which were going to be allowed to be waived in the Upton Amendment to the American Health Care Act last May. Uh, that precipitated me getting in to this race because I knew as one of the nation's leading health care innovators that we did not need to sacrifice the quality of insurance products to help people in, uh, achieve a healthier life. Uh, we can continue to innovate to save money by investing in prevention, in community health interventions that are going to reduce costs, improve health quality, uh, create jobs, and also improve uh, health equity. Those are things that we can do in the construct of the Affordable Care Act, but we have to go beyond where the Affordable Care Act started us out. Free trade. Uh, there's a lot taking place right now. We're seeing uh, a number of tariffs being slapped on countries. There's retaliation. And job creation is all a part of this as well. When you look at free trade, the economy, what would your vision be as a member of Congress? Um, so the tariffs that we're seeing going back and forth, um, I believe, are going to end up hurting many families in this district. I come from a farming family. My great-great-grandparents walked here uh, in, from Pennsylvania in the 1860s to set down roots. I'm the first member of my family in five generations not to work the family farm. I have plenty of third, fourth, fifth cousins who are worried about the tariffs on pork, on soy, you name it. The cost of farm equipment because of steel and aluminum tariffs is also driving up the cost of farming and agriculture in this community. Uh, and we're going to see harvest time, I think, October, shortly before the election just how much of a pinch this is putting on independent farmers in this district, as well as other small business owners. When it comes to free trade, I think that we have to recognize that it's been a mixed bag in NAFTA, CAFTA. Um, what I do not su support is fast track authority to be pushing trade deals through the, with executive branch leadership without congressional oversight. I think that Congress in a number of ways has abdicated its responsibility to the executive, not just in trade, um, in also in terms of defense and other things, but that Congress needs to provide oversight and make sure that human rights are a part of free trade agreements. I think part of the reason why we've seen a rush to the bottom in terms of wages in certain sectors of our economy after trade deals like NAFTA have been created is because we didn't put workers' rights and human rights into the deal. We need to make sure that international labor and other groups are a part of these negotiations so that human rights on both sides of any border that we're negotiating trade deals with are respected and metrics for, by which we can go back in and change trade deals later when we learn and apply new learnings to future trade policies. Democrat Dr. Matt Longjohn. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we wrap up our candidate forum. Our final segment is being recorded Friday, August 17th with U.S. Taxpayers Party candidate Stephen J. Young from Hopkins. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. Uh, there has been an environmental issue that has cropped up in your district. It's an issue that's been coming to the forefront in a number of areas across the state of Michigan, and that is PFAS. Uh, PFAS has been discovered in Parchment and in Cooper Township. What is the government's role, the EPA's role, in investigating, researching, and cleaning up these issues? It really is a state issue, and it should be handled uh, by the state. Um, the companies involved, the communities involved, need to have it investigated and looked into. Obviously, we desire uh, clean water for uh, our people, and uh, the amount that is dangerous is, is really still in question. They've lowered that down from the standard it was just probably a year ago or so. And so it needs to be investigated and figure out what can be accomplished there uh, if the water still can be purified and, and what sources we have available. So as a federal government a, a congressman, we're interested obviously in our, in our area, but it's uh, the state's position first it should be to look at this and control it uh, outside of the federal government's realm of responsibility. As a member of Congress, would you want EPA to investigate a situation like this? Not until, the, not until the state had fully looked into it itself in its own DEQ and water control agencies. Uh, immigration has been a, a big issue uh, in this country. Uh, DACA has been debated, uh, a path to, to citizenship, uh, a border wall. 
Where are you on these issues of immigration? If in Congress, what policies would you want the federal government to adhere to? The control and protection of our government is a federal responsibility and immigration, although the requirements have changed over the last few hundred years, uh, legal immigration has always been what has been required by law. And uh, those that would come in unlawfully are illegal. So we need to look at our immigration policy for that. Um, obviously, there's some who have been in the nation for some time now and, and children that are born here, and that can be considered. But still, when the law is put in there for a purpose, uh, people are expected to abide by that law, and that is what we would look at enforcing from a, a federal standpoint. As far as border security, uh, there's talk of a wall. Is that something that, as a congressional leader, you would want to have financed, or are there other technologies that could be put in place? Where do, you, where do you stand? Border security can be set up if we would move a number of people to the border to watch it humanly and with, with cameras, infrared, there's different things like that without specifically a wall. I'm not against a wall, I definitely consider that, but the funding of that has to be in a way that uh, we don't increase deficit, in fact we're way, way too far in a financial crisis because we spend money on things that are unconstitutional. But board security is definitely a constitutional matter. Uh, the issue of health care, uh, long debated in this country. Do you support the Affordable Care Act? Would you repeal and replace it? Is there some other form of health care that you feel would replace uh, the Affordable Care Act? Or is this a, an issue where let the market determine health care in our country? Within the federal constitution, there is absolutely no place for the federal government to be involved in health care. That's just the bottom line. Uh, it belongs to the states and to the people. And therefore, I am against federal help in that area whatsoever. Uh, again, the, the issue is what is constitutional and what is not. And uh, that's where we would take any look at these sorts of things. Free trade. Uh, the, this country is all about job creation. We just had uh, tax reform that went into place in, in our country in recent months. And now we're seeing uh, tariffs that are being slapped on a number of countries. Where do you stand on free trade job creation? Uh, what is government's role? If the government, the federal government, gets out of job creation, the workload will take care of itself. This country was founded on tariffs. It was set up that way. Much of our income, if you want to call that, our expenses that were paid for by tariffs. And so that is a constitutional way to go about it. Uh, to have free trade with any nation that is willing to trade with this is, is a good thing. But it would have to be done uh, in accordance, again, with law. The job creation, again, if the government backs off attempting to control every minute detail of businesses, our, our jobs would explode, and it's far too much federal control, and that's a major problem. You're getting through these questions a little faster than the other two <laughs> candidates, so you're, you're, get, you're getting into the bonus territory now. Uh, Second Amendment. We've seen a number of school shootings uh, in the last year. We've had other mass shootings in this country. There's now 3D printing of guns. Uh, firm believer in the Constitution, Second Amendment. Um, where are you on, on gun rights, gun control, and the federal government? Once again, the Second Amendment, and going back to uh, what the Declaration of Independence calls our God-given rights, um, there is no place for any type of federal gun control for personal use whatsoever. If, for some reason, we, the people, would decide that maybe certain types of weapons would not be lawful or should not be lawful, it should require an amendment to the Constitution, which would totally remove the Second Amendment and add one that is reworded, which covers the same types of issues, but being specific about what type of weapons we shouldn't think the individual should be ha uh, allowed to have. But it has to be performed, again, constitutionally with amendment to the Constitution. Every law that has been written to limit gun control is really unconstitutional. Some of them are quite practical. Obviously, we don't want people running around shooting one another for no cause. But things must be done lawfully. And uh, for the most part, they're not right now when it comes to a Second Amendment 
So you would have to change the amendment. Regulation is not an option. Regulation is not an option. You must remove the law as it is by an amendment and then put one in place to cover those issues. All right, final question. Yes, Foreign sir. policy, uh, did the United States respond adequately to Russia's meddling in the 2016 presidential election? And should what should the U.S.'s position be when it comes to f the foreign policy with Russia? Almost every country that's of any substantial position has tried to look in and spy on other people's elections and how their government is being run and uh, even put their attempt to control certain aspects of it. Uh, we attempted under Obama to control the Israeli election not that long ago. And so that's a common thing among nations. Um, the Russian investigation is blown way out of proportion, and we need to close that up and get on with life. U.S. Taxpayer Party candidate, Stephen Young. Thank, thank you, you so for much. Your time. Thank you. And I'd like to thank all the candidates for taking the time to join us for this Decision 2018 Candidate Forum. We asked the candidates questions on a number of issues. The extended interviews can be found at WGVU.org slash politics. From all of us here at WGVU Public Media, get out and vote.